Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. On 12 January 2010, an earthquake measuring 7.0 on the Richter scale hit Haiti, killing over 222,000 people and injuring over 300,000 more. Many others were left homeless. The epicenter of the earthquake was Léogone, a city about 15 miles west of Port-au-Prince, but the devastation was felt all over Haiti. A couple of months later, I was asked to help design a low-cost house for a new charity composed mostly of Haitian-born Americans determined to help Haiti with long-range housing and economic solutions. Since I knew nothing of local building customs or supply chains, I wanted to go there and see for myself what could be done. While many of us were taking our first look at the problem, for many others, Haiti has long been a cause. Many hearts and minds, many individuals and organizations had already been working for years on solving Haiti's problems and had not yet succeeded. The president of the organization called the mayor of Patientville personally and asked what he could do to help. She said they were tired of relief and really needed to change how things were done in Haiti. It was an eye-opening experience on Haitian politics and Haitian cultures and the world of the NGO, the non-governmental organization. And our extreme sincerity was probably only exceeded by our extreme naivete. And perhaps no building better represented the situation in Haiti than the Kinam Hotel in Patientville. Originally built at the end of the 19th century by French-trained Haitian architects, the Bouteau family, hospitality entrepreneurs since 1920, purchased the small hotel in 1983, renovated and expanded it. Its gingerbread style, classically inspired wood cutouts imitating Greco-Roman stone buildings, is its visual brand. It is light in its appearance, almost a fantasy in three dimensions, exuding serenity. The delicate wood, its fine tracery and deep overhangs set it apart from the harsher concrete houses that covered the hills around it. The Kinam Hotel survived the earthquake and continued to be an oasis of soothing comfort while the rest of Haiti was in turmoil. To their credit, the Bouteau family built a world-class hotel with amenities, with style, against enormous odds, and I cannot begrudge their success in attracting world-class clients. But just outside of the Kinam Hotel is the real Haiti, full of people, with just as much enthusiasm and intrepidness and drive, but their government and the carpet-bagging NGOs have done nothing to materially change how things get done or don't get done in Haiti. The quake hit the middle class harder than anybody else. The poor lived in shanty towns constructed of corrugated metal and fiberglass. The quake hit, their houses collapsed, but fewer got killed by it. And the next day they simply reassembled their corrugated metal and fiberglass houses and they were back to normal. But the middle class lived in concrete homes. The concrete and concrete block industry in Haiti is ubiquitous, but quality varied. And the use of steel reinforcing was minimal. Steel is what allows concrete to resist tensile and lateral forces. And when the quake hit, many people were crushed to death when these concrete homes collapsed. At that point of our visit, the homeless lived in tents everywhere. Tents were in every public square, empty lots flattened by the earthquake, and on the medians of a highway. In Léogon, we saw all sorts of foreign groups experimenting with prototypical housing, some of it comical. Many of the officials and charities already doing the hard relief work aiding Haitians regarded us as just another NGO trying to profit from the relief money flowing into Haiti. For Haiti, the earthquake was just another thing that the Haitian people had to deal with. They would just simply walk around the piles of rubble on their way to work or to school. Haitians had suffered from civic neglect for centuries while their leaders profited off their oppression. This was just a major earthquake. What 
gave me hope were the Haitian people themselves. They seemed determined to face each day and find a way to survive. Even those living in tents daily washed and dressed neatly. There was a thriving economy. People were selling things on the street. Mangoes, cell phones, clothes, sugarcane, tires, money changing, etc. It is an economy organized around the fact that the government provides no services. There is no public transportation to speak of. So industrious Haitians converted two-ton pickups to minivans they called tap-taps. There is no city trash collection, so it is all thrown into alleys and big gullies. Goats and pigs roam around that trash, converting it into food. And they eat everything but the plastic water bottles, which is how Haitians get their drinking water. Grandmothers buy a dozen mangoes from the market in the morning, walk three miles, and sit down and sell them for a profit in the street as a convenience to others. And some Haitians have created a cottage industry, salvaging earthquake debris with simple hand tools. I am not saying the situation is acceptable. We Americans would not put up with an economy set up this way or the standard of living. What I am saying is that in spite of no help from the civic authorities or effective help from the NGOs, the Haitian people themselves have created an economy that would thrive even more if they were freed from the constraints that are put upon them. When asked if something could be done in a possibly different and maybe even better way, we usually got the sardonic response, well, you're in Haiti now. The economy is fed by relief and money sent by the Haitian diaspora from around the world. Clothes move quickly through the market and onto the backs of the Haitians. All goods coming to Haiti, even relief, are taxed at 30%. The only way to avoid the tax is to bribe the right customs official. And government officials are populated with members of the few powerful families who run Haiti and get richer every day. One church in Haiti was trying to train workers and organize a clothing factory. Their vision was to produce all soccer uniforms that Haitians buy from other countries. They too needed funding to get started. But like us and other well-intentioned groups, finding all that money that was supposedly floating around was difficult. It seemed like the big NGOs and the global initiatives were sucking up all the cash. And we would have worked with those big guys too, but we never met them. To save money, we were sleeping on the floor of a house without running water, whereas all the big officials from the NGOs and global initiatives were staying at the Kinam Hotel in luxury. The original idea that the team had was to build a laku. Laku is the term for a village, and I apologize, my Creole isn't any better than any other language I speak. Each laku would be a series of single room houses made from pre-cut wood structures. The materials would be partially assembled in the United States and shipped in containers to a site. We were not asking to be given any land, we just wanted to be given permission to build someplace. The houses would be earthquake resistant, survive in a tropical environment, and be passively cooled. They would have a water collection system, a composting toilet, and a low voltage solar electric system for a light, a radio, and charging a cell phone. We envisioned a dozen or so houses in a laku on fresh land organized around a village industry. Each laku would be a family group, and might be in the business of building other villages, agriculture, or clothing manufacturer, etc. But Haitians tend to congregate around cities because that is where the NGO services are most available. The mayor of Patientville said she wanted a more urban solution, and so our vision changed. And we saw that some major public works projects might change how things get done in Haiti. For example, viable roads could be made using the rubble from the buildings if we could get some basic earth moving and grading equipment to Haiti. Most Haitians will drink only bottled water. The bottles are tossed into those storm water drainage gullies with the rest of the trash, and there's no recycling value to them. We saw that fresh mountain rainwater would surge down these gullies through the cities and drain directly into the sea untapped. If someone would build a terraced reservoir above each city, we could control the flooding and provide each city with a portable water supply under pressure, and perhaps even create some hydroelectric power. It was all simple, but we did not have the means to get it started.
And so are house design adapted to the urban sites. Urban houses would need to be closer together, and introducing wood would mean greater risk of devastating fires in cities that have no fire department. Even if there was a fire department, there is no public water supply, no hydrants for knocking down fires. And so we decided we could use locally produced concrete block to create fire resistance. And we would use it in such a way that was not done prior to the last earthquake, which led to the destruction of so many concrete homes. To respond to the urban environment then, the house design needed to be more flexible. It needed to be able to be built alone or attached to other houses. It needed to be able to be built along straight streets or curved streets, on hilly sites or flat sites. And so the Lequet Model A design emerged. Lequet is the Creole word for house. It would have two block walls perpendicular to each other to support each other in case of an earthquake. We would bring horizontal steel reinforcement from America and infill the holes with mortar and rebar every four feet, something that was not previously done in common concrete houses built in Haiti. There would also be an elevated block base to allow cool air below, animals to seek shade, and access to the tank of the composting toilet. Above that would be the pre-cut wood panels from America assembled in Haiti. The wood is painted on the exterior, whatever color the occupant wants, but it is unfinished on the interior to allow moisture to transpire out of the wood framing to prevent rot. High and low windows vent hot air. The windows have screens, storm shutters, and security grills, but no glass. Each house would have a barrel for collecting rainwater for washing. The sink would drain into a dry well. On top of each house was a solar panel for charging a 12 volt battery to operate a 12 volt light, radio, and charge a cell phone. The house therefore was independent of any utility hookup. And while it might look small to us for a family of six, it was certainly an improvement over a tent. Our next goal was to bring the cost of each house to below $10,000, which was viable at the time. And then we would go to every house of worship in Westchester and Fairfield County and raise $10,000 and tell that parish, look, if you raise $10,000, we can take a family out of a tent and put them into a permanent home. And we would rely on Haitian officials to tell us where to build these houses. They wouldn't have to give us the land. They just tell us where we build the house, and then they would pick the family that would go into the house. So we were unlike other NGOs that wanted to be given the land so that they could resell it and make a profit. We just wanted permission to build. Most architects will not discuss their failed projects. And I consider this a failure because in spite of our effort for years, we were never able to build a single house in Haiti. No one's life got better. We certainly didn't change how things were done. Perhaps we were naive in that we were working against this huge tide of history and our little not-for-profit was just not powerful enough. Well, you're in Haiti now. I don't know what the current situation is in Haiti. It simply has dropped off the news. We still have the design, so if anybody out there thinks these ideas are useful anywhere in the world to improve housing, I would gladly give away all the concepts and ideas that we worked on just to make somebody's life a little bit better. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.